guys so welcome back to the channel um, we've got another high production value video for you today just with an update on the k-swap into my ep91 that i'm doing uh, from the first video uh, a few of you have asked um, just to see the engine mounts um, in more detail specifically the rear mount so we'll run through that today and then as well as just a general sort of progress update on the build as well it's not the most exciting update today you can probably see from the background that everything has been removed um, so it looks like we've gone backwards we haven't <laughs> I'll explain why um, in a moment but I'll give you a run through on the latest and then what we're going to be doing moving forward as well okay so from the last video um, there's been some good progress <laughs> it doesn't look that way I suppose it looks like we've gone backwards seeing as everything has been removed from the car but I think I explained in the first video that the engine and gearbox that were in the car previously when all the fabrication work was being done um, it was just a, essentially a dummy engine and gearbox um, with the crank rods, um, pistons, etc. removed. So it was a lot lighter uh, and easier to move around when um, yeah, the engine was being put into the car in the first place. So um, that has now all been removed. Um, I think for anyone that's seen uh, my previous Galanza build, I can insert a picture into the video now. I think you'll know that I do quite like um, a nice, tidy, clean engine bay. I try to do things properly so that's why everything has been removed so we can strip the engine bay um, back to just the metal essentially with all the components removed key it all up prime it and then repaint it um, as well i've made a few marks on the bulkhead because i do have to do a few bits of trimming um, here and there not not for the engine to make it fit but for my wiring loom so i'm having um, an assortment of um, auto sport connectors um, on the bulkhead just to pass the wiring loom through um, for ease so that's all underway as well um, a couple of you asked for a better view of the rear mount because you couldn't really see that in the first video so that has been removed and I've got it on the bench uh, behind me so I can show you that in more detail okay so it might not be the most exciting video today but um, hopefully it's all good information for those of you that are looking to do the swap um, I had a few of you ask in terms of the notching for the gearbox on the passenger chassis rail side so hopefully this shot um, shows you that actually you don't need to take out um, all that much and it's then relatively easy to box back in but what I'll do I'll, I'll just put a tape measure in um, for reference as well just so you can see uh, how much I've done and hopefully you can see that I know this isn't going to be perfect but just to give you a gauge that's about 260 mil across there and then just coming down I did a, approximately 30 mil um, so yeah as you can see there as well so in all honesty this is the only sort of cutting that you you have to do um, so it's actually quite quite minimal um, the majority of the work is um, just fabricating the engine mounts this is the only bit of the chassis um, that, that needs to be notched so it's nice that it's, it's pretty minimal um, a couple of people asked to see um, the engine mounts in close detail specifically the rear mount and how it had been done because um, you can't see it when the engine is still in the car the engine is has now been removed because i'm just stripping the engine bay down ready to paint it um i've got a few little bits of work to do on the bulkhead to mount uh, my auto sport connectors um for the wiring loom so yeah i thought it would be a good opportunity before they go off to be powder coated just to show you them in more detail so i've laid them out how uh, it would be um, in the engine so this is the train side Obviously the rear, the rear mount, and then the gearbox end over here. I think these first two you've probably seen in good enough detail um, from the first video anyway. So what we'll do, we'll focus on the rear gearbox mount. So for those of you that know the Starlet chassis quite well, the um, rear gearbox mount on the OE engine is just a simple sort of three bolt um, arrangement uh, I think 17 mil from memory that just go up sort of straight into the floor by um, the tunnel so for this mount we've we've utilized um, the same mounting points there um, and then underneath again we've used the same bushes as we have on the, the chain and the gearbox side just for ease um, 
that slips into this sort of bracketry here as well. So I suppose it's, it's a little bit hard to visualize um, now it's out of the car, but I'll, I'll put some pictures in um, as well. But essentially this is mounting onto the back of the gearbox um, with these two bolt holes here, and then a uh, third support up at the top there. Okay, I'll just hold up and try and do a 360 so you get sort of the full view. Just what I did on those little spaces there because you'll see when it's in the car that doesn't quite sit flush so that's what these are for. Please excuse the rust. <laughs> They've been sitting for a while now but yeah they're going to be off to be blasted and, uh, and powder coated. So as before it's just a sort of a three mil mild steel because they're going to be powder coated they didn't need to to be stainless and then mild steel is more cost effective also. Um, a couple of people have asked me as well the plan is that now they're out of the car um i will some parts were drawn before some parts were just done ad hoc on the car but i will get them drawn um so i will be able to make um, a few more sets for anyone that is interested both these engine side um and then the chassis side ones okay, so now all the fabrication work uh, has been done and you can see that the engine bay strip has been stripped down we can actually start to focus on some of the more exciting parts of the build now in terms of putting everything um, back together. Um, so I thought just this week we'll focus on the turbo system in terms of some of the parts I've chosen and, and the reasons for that. Uh, and then just so you can have a look at the manifold downpipe, um, wastegate recirc and the, the, the turbocharger in more detail um, as well. So because of packaging reasons, I decided to have all of my parts um, custom made most likely you will be able to use some K-SWAT specific manifold if you wanted to. Um, I can't confirm, seeing as I haven't uh, obviously gone that route, um, but you might be able to because you'll see that from the previous video, when the engine is in, there's actually a, there's not a bad amount of room in terms of getting a manifold in there. It's just more tighter um, on the downpipe. So you may find yet a, a K-SWAT uh, manifold will fit but yeah uh, as explained so mine has been completely custom made so it was done by the guys at alpha performance uh, fabrication in wellingborough so good bunch of guys over there it was liam that specifically i think who did most of the work um, on my car so check those guys out if you're in the market for anything similar so i decided to go with a sidewinder style manifold i think a lot of k series they do run this style of manifold but i had uh essentially no room to the uh, clutch uh, master cylinder if I wanted to run sort of a ram horn manifold uh, behind but I actually quite like uh, the positioning of the sidewinder anyway so you'll see um, that I've opted for a wastegate uh, priority manifold uh, the reason being so in my um, sort of previous experiences when I've been calibrating k20s on the dyno you'll find so many manifolds on the market have very poor wastegate placement which can cause a lot of issues when trying to control your boost this is specifically important um when you've like mine it's a, it's a stock k20 uh, because you need to cap the torque to keep the rods in the engine essentially um so if you have bad boost control um it makes that job very very difficult um to do so what you'll find if you've got bad flow to the wastegate you'll essentially run no electronically controlled boost control at all. So essentially you remove the, um, the boost solenoid from the equation. You will have just the bottom port on the wastegate connected to the boost source and you would essentially just do a run. And what you'll see is that the boost would say start at, could start at five, six, seven PSI. And then by the end of the run, it's peaked at sort of 14, 15 PSI without us doing anything uh, electronically. Um, to, to, to cause that and the reason for that is essentially that the the exhaust gas flow cannot get through um, the wastegate at a quick enough rate before hitting um, the, the turbine side of the turbocharger thus increasing the turbo speed and making more boost so you may have seen or heard the term wastegate priority manifold um, which is essentially exactly what this is that you're, you've got flow obviously coming through the runners and the first part it's actually going to hit is the bottom um, of the wastegate valve so you are going to get very 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 good boost control 
and you won't really have any uh, sort of detrimental effect on response um, as well. So in terms of the manifold, um, it's all been fully back purged. Um, it's a T3 flange here with a 44 mil um, turbo smart sort of wastegate takeoff. Um, because I'm now old and boring, you'll see that I've had the um, external wastegate plumb back into the exhaust um, just on a bellow here for some flexibility as well. Um, I did actually want the wastegate sort of at the front of the manifold as long as the flow was going to be good uh, because, again, in my previous uh, sort of profession working on dynos, if you have an issue with, say, the wastegate split diaphragm or you need to change the spring or one of the vacuum lines has been melted because they haven't been um, correctly insulated. It's a pain in the arse to try and get at things when it's on the back of the manifold, underneath the manifold, especially when it's all in the car. So this sits right at the front, so it's nice and easily accessible and we're not losing anything in terms of sort of wastegate flow performance there as well. So you'll see in the manifold, actually if I just turn it around underneath here, we've had um, a few sort of bungs and bits and pieces added. Um, so I think most of you would be able to work it out here. So we've had um, four EGT um, fittings just tapped in so we can look at the individual exhaust gas temperatures when we're calibrating the car. Now the sensors will stay in there all the time. So again, when we're running, um, they will be used just for any sort of fault finding and checking or just balancing um, the airflow between the cylinders as well. You'll see again in, in data that you'll have um, some cylinders that may run hotter or colder. Um, it's not quite as good as having a, a lambda sensor um, in each runner, but an EGT will give you um, a good idea of which cylinder is running hotter or colder based on the airflow um, through the engine. So that's what they're for. And then on the back here, um, we've got just a 1.8 um, boss put on there also. Um, so this will be for exhaust manifold pressure um, as well. So it's quite a nice um, data sample to have. Uh, it can be used for multiple things, specking turbochargers, understanding whether your turbocharger exhaust housing is the correct size. Um, it can also be used in control, in the ECU mapping to account for things like barometric pressure changes if you're running the car at altitude. I don't have that issue being in the UK and I'm not planning to, to sort of take it up any mountains or Pikes Peak for example, um, but again it's a nice um, sensor to, to have there so you can assess uh, and review turbo performance. Um, so the downpipe, uh, again it's all been back purged, it's a three inch uh, downpipe. You'll see there's quite a few bungs um, here, we've got um, three at the top, you might be able to see it, we've got one at the bottom there um, as well. So because I'm a bit of a data junkie, a data nerd, um, we've had these bosses put on um, for control and monitoring sensors. So the top one up here is a, a post-turbo EGT. This will be the primary lambda sensor and then this port here will be used to monitor exhaust back pressure. Um, as well. So for those of you that don't know exhaust back pressure and turbulence in the exhaust can cause quite um, a difference to your lambda reading. So having a pressure sensor there will enable us to review the data and actually correct um, the lambda reading based on um, exhaust back pressure as well. The bung at the bottom, so again if I want to do any sort of further lambda testing or run a secondary lambda further in, down in the downpipe, um, that can be added in um, as well. Okay, so lastly, moving on to the turbocharger, um, I've opted for a Borg Warner S257. Um, it's a T3 housing um, at the rear. The AOR is, is a 0.82 from memory. Um, I found from having a few K20s on the dyno that they actually like a slightly larger um, AOR on the turbine housing. You, you could fit a 0.64 or something in that range, which would give you a slightly better response. But I think you'll you'll find with the slightly larger housing with the K20 exhaust flow, it does quite like it and you don't really lose uh, a massive amount of spool as well. Um, I traditionally actually run Borg Warner EFR turbos, um, but when I actually started the swap, I originally set out to see how cost effectively um, you could do it. I know. I suppose that might be a little bit out the window now with 
with some of these other custom parts but for the money um, it's actually a very very good uh, turbocharger i've calibrated some of them on k20s before the response is good and they make very very good power relatively easily um, as well but the thing that sort of drew me to it is the fact that even though it's not the efr series they're already uh, tapped and machined for the turbo speed sensor so you don't have to use this but again this is a nice sensor to have to assess turbo performance make sure that you're not um, sort of running um, into the surge line or, or, or the choke line um, as well which will protect the turbocharger you can use turbo speed depending on your ecu and your boost control strategies as well to make sure that you're not going to overspeed the turbo and, and damage it um, and then also here we have the um, takeoff for your uh, boost reference for your uh, wastegate already sort of machined there. Both of them they're machined, you do just have to drill them out as well. So for anyone that has this turbocharger as well, um, they don't come pre-drilled. Um, Otherwise, obviously, if you weren't using them, um, you'd be having a boost leak out of your turbo housing. Um, so the next stage for all of this is to have the downpipe, the exhaust manifold, um, just the wastegate link, and then the turbine housing uh, on the turbo ceramic coated. You'll see from the previous video, it does sit quite close um, to the bulkhead. So any heat management um, that, that, that can be done, um, it's it's definitely it's definitely worth doing. OK, so I hope you all enjoyed the update. And yet yeah, moving forward, we'll keep you updated with further progress. And then in the next video, we'll take a closer look um, at some of the other parts that will be going onto the build.